in 2014-15, the school district uh, repositioned and set its shared vision with the community to become a thriving community of learners in an environment that embraces a culture of thinking connected to the mission of the school to engage and inspire the hearts and minds of every learner every day and the guiding belief statements and I'll just skip to the bottom one and focus on communities that invest in youth prosper it's really that um, the community helped develop this mission and vision and belief statements which is really the uh, drives the Quaker Valley programming and budget process so Act 1 also sets the timelines that we are to follow in the budget preparation. We are required by February 14th to adopt a preliminary budget. In January, pass a resolution to not go above the index. March 1st is the deadline to file those homestead applications. And it's also the deadline to file for referendum exceptions, which, which the district did do this year. But it's when the school districts get notified of the amount of the gambling money that's available for us to pass back to the taxpayers as property tax relief. And then May 31st is our deadline to adopt the proposed final budget, which well, you know we already have here at Quaker Valley on April 17th. And then deadline to adopt the final budget is June 30th and then the property tax bills go out July 1st which would include the property tax relief so act one kind of sets the framework for what our process is and timelines for developing the budget in, in conjunction with um, you know the um, if, if something would need to go to a referendum that's kind of sets the timetable for that so then we develop our budget calendar based on you know those parameters May 15th will be our next finance committee meeting which will go over any updates to some of the data today and hopefully uh, pass and adopt a final budget on on May 21st ahead of the June 30th deadline uh, you, you've read and heard of all the funding challenges in the state of Pennsylvania and in the budget challenges that uh, let alone the state has in their deficit situation and uh, what they're doing you know relative to balancing their own budget and it, and it really does trickle down you know to the schools because that's part of you know their uh, the state's budget and uh, there's been uh, you know no no shortage of um, articles on the Peacers crisis that we'll talk about more and no shortage of ar articles on the challenges that school districts public schools in Pennsylvania are facing uh, you know relative to you know not only funding but a lot of the things we'll talk today about mandates and and um, you know guidelines to run the school district um, but you know our, our peers you, you probably you know read about peers and you know talking about the challenges in schools and and um, you know some significant uh, you know cutbacks and layoffs and you know things that are facing all public schools well Quaker Valley's not necessarily immune to that I just wanted to show the historical you know annual financial reports where you can see you know the trends here so if you look at the um, number here that is the net surplus deficit just the history of that we were you know we've been to the positive every year you know through 2014 15 and then 15 16 and 16 17 you know our operations were to the negative and it really has been a culmination of a lot of the things we'll talk today about the the pressures on the mandates um, and the you know and primarily the Peacers contributions charter schools and th and things of that nature that kind of you know are hitting Quaker Valley you know you know down the line I've, so this is kind of the summary for the, the the two current years so 17 18 which is where we saw you know we if we go back we see that we're you know headed in that direction and then we had a very challenging budget in 17 18 you know where we had a projected deficit of 1.2 million and we knew you know we didn't know that those things were going to occur and those piece or spikes were going to occur um, and you know it was um, it, it was no that this was coming too if I come back here you'll see that you know of you know with this you know surpluses you know we were able to you know create you know fund balance uh, within the district and make sure that we plan to reserve funds for some of this you know crisis to manage through so you'll you'll see that uh, a lot of this spike you know was planned for and you know ma made sure that we started enhancing some strategic planning on the budgeting process looking for ways to uh, uh, creatively um, you know save money with save money without hindering you know pro programs 
uh, of the district. And, um, you know, the net result, um, and we'll get into details, but, you know, our proposed final budget this year, you'll see, is significantly starting to move in the other direction. Now that there is a balancing act with, you know, we did, you know, we are raising taxes above the index, and, you know, we'll talk about, you know, about that, and also strategic changes, you know, that were made to, you know, help reduce expenditures and, and move this in the other direction. So starting with the, you know, the projected expenditures of 50 million 102601, you know, our largest, you know, this pie chart is no different than what we've seen in previous years where, you know, our biggest in investment is in salary and benefits, you know, for our, our um, staff and in, you know, debt service for our facilities. And then we have um, other categories broken out there for transportation, cyber charter schools that will hit on some of the mandates that drive the um, so just wanted to take se uh, several slides here to just kind of go over, you know, some of these, you know, cost drivers of the district and just touch on these legislative proposals because we talked about Act 1 and there's some other happenings going on, but, um, you know, we'll focus on some of these underfunded mandates and what the impact is to the school as far as charter school payments, uh, you know, pension payments, which is the, you know, the PSERS piece and the special education costs. Um, and also wanted to just note about, you know, there are things that, you know, other than mandates that are potentially going to impact public schools and, you know, and more so Quaker Valley on the first one and the School Vouchers Choice Program. It's really, you know, in enhancing the charter schools that we're going to talk about is, you know, um, shifting money from public schools to, um, you know, private schools. And the Medicaid caps and guidelines, um, you know, we've had some administrative guidelines there already change for how um, and, and what that is is that we we have what's called a school-based school access program where we get reimbursement for um, special services provided for special needs for Medicaid eligible uh, students and they've really changed the dynamic as to how, you know what they're funding there and we've seen our revenues you know go down already and now they're talking about adding caps and more uh, stringent processes in place to, you know, to um, find those dollars. You know, some some of the cost drivers. This this is just setting for hey, you know, sometimes that's well, why do we, have, you know, we have administrative costs and you know there there are a lot of things that we're required to do, whether it's curriculum alignment to the state, you know, certain programs that we have to offer, alternative education services, uh, big ones, you know, such as mandated testing. You know, some of some of these are um, just bullet points for you know things we're required to do, you know, some are, you know, hot buttons for, you know, opinions on whether the mandated testing, you know, is, um, you know, is appropriate or not. Um, we also have a lot of reporting that we have to do, you know, relative to, you know, both students, programs, everything where we set uh, data that we have to provide the state on a regular basis. For um, so the school safety, we have to report all the incidents for that. Inter-school athletic opportunities is relative to, you know, Title IX requirements, you know, test partition participation rates to go along with the mandated testing. So lots of things that we're required, you know, required to do. And not necessarily negatively required to do. The, the point is that there's, you know, dollars associated with it because school safety is obviously, you know, one of our priorities and, you know, we want, you know, we want to continue to enhance that but there are several things that we're you know required to do for school safety and I believe we're going to see a lot more of this that you're reading about that will be school requirements that will um, you know have some um, you know costs associated with it as well special education costs where you know providing a free and appropriate public education for all students just sets that guideline for students with um, uh, IEPs individualized education programs and the supports that you know uh, the guidelines for the supports that we're required to do for those students that drive costs and we'll see some numbers relative to that as well and transportation as we started talking about that before the you know the session where we are required to transport 
support within a 10 mile radius, non-public schools and charter school students, and also, you know, a current law now with, you know, homeless youth. So if, you know, if it's a, a district of origin as Quaker Valley, you know, we do have to, um, you know, get that student here. So some of these cost drivers, you know, this will just show you graphically, you know, some significant dollars associated with some of these cost drivers. And our piecers, you know, obviously we talk about every year. And you can just see the upward trend, you know, in that to where, you know, we have predicted going in 26, 27 up to 9.5 million. You know, a little chart that kind of shows, uh, you know, that same, um, you know, data in a, in a chart format will show you, also shows you the rates. You you know, so if you go back to uh, even 2004, 2005, where it was 4.23% was our employer rate, our rate for 18, 19 in this budget is 33.43. So it's gone up, you know, uh, gee, that's like 690% that that's, uh, that the rate has gone up over time. Now the district does receive a 50%, you know, reimbursement from the state for those services. So I always look at this net cost, even though I see it on the revenue and expenditure side uh, so you can see just over that you know 15 year period you know that's an extra three three point one million you know hit to uh, net hit to the you know district's budget so pretty significant so the next big um, uh, mandated cost that you know impacts the schools is charter school costs. Now, for Quaker Valley, we've you know we've historically you know um, um, maintained a level of about 28 to 30 kids that choose charter schools here, and that's so so it's been you know we haven't had like you know big spikes where another five you know five kids have left the district, but our costs go up because the tuition rate uh, calculation for charter schools goes up every year based on our expenditures going up and some other uh, in the calculation you know per the per the code so you see that continue to grow and uh, you know when charter schools started the state did because we're going to talk about all these funding aspects too the state started in 0809 you know they reimbursed 30 percent of the tuition you know so when charter school enrollment started rising and rising and rising that 30% now put a pressure on the state as well to fund that 30%, you know, so they have to balance their budget too. So hence, what do you think happened? They got, you know, they got rid of the funding. <laughs> But, you know, really, you know, the, that level of funding went away. So those, you know, all of those costs reside with, you know, the district. So um, one of the legislative things that we talked about was proposals, increased proposals for school choice. Not that anybody's necessarily against school choice, but it becomes a, you know, who's funding that choice and, you know, where are the dollars coming from. So, you know, we see that shift occurring from, you know, from public education. So another big, you know, mandate is special ed education. You know that the, you know the services and 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 costs have been rising, and the same thing. This chart is showing you the state funding and then the access program that we talked about is at the bottom. You know where you can see that you know the access funding has been decreasing, and um, you know the state funding, although it's gone up, you know, you can see it's you know goes up five thousand dollars, six thousand dollars each year. And I'll have a little detail out there too. Um, you know, breaking that down, um, but certainly not pacing with the level of uh, increases in expenditures, and you could, and, and the state actually froze. If you go back to 2010-11 to 13-14, you know they they froze the level of special ed funding. You know, so we weren't even districts weren't even seeing increases there. So it's really this challenging dynamic of of you know how the state's funding education you know for that I will shift shift over to the revenue side and we'll talk about you know the funding and the the, the nature of uh, this pie charts look the same too as well and you can see for Quaker Valley you know our biggest source of revenue is the local taxpayers at 82 percent state at 15 percent federal and other two percent and we'll go through you know some of those um, you know some of those dynamics and challenges as well so 
you know, for, you know, a lot of the state funding, and this isn't just, you know, it certainly isn't intended to be the complete basis for, you know, how the state funds, but they, they do fund based on, you know, wealth categories and, and ratios, market value personal income aid ratio, market value aid ratio. These ratios are all used that in calculations that drive state subsidies and reimbursements. And also, and I, I added on my chart the Act 1 index for the purpose of you seeing where we're, you know, so you see Quaker Valley at the bottom of the chart of, you know, our aid ratios are the lowest in the state. That's the lowest that you could possibly have, 0 0.15, 0 0.10, 0 0.10. And, uh, you know, so there's a lot of details behind that, but it just, the, you know, the bottom line is this is indicators that Quaker Valley, um, you know, is asked to contribute more locally based on these factors of propensity to pay, you know, th that requirement is there. So even in the Act 1 category where we said it was 2.4%, and, and yes, every school could qualify for referendum exceptions to go above that, as we mentioned. You know, but um, there is also for schools that have a you know a higher market value aid ratio. You know, in the you know financial. Um, um, background of that you know district may not be as strong as Quaker Valley's they allow for an adjusted index you know to that based on those factors so if you go clear you know you come up here to you know South Fayette South Fayette's allowed to raise 3.1 percent you know without referendum or without exceptions Quaker Valley's 2.4 so there is this kind of you know balancing of um, you know, equalization to what the wealth indicators are in the districts, but also, you know, pushes back that the ones on the bottom are obviously the ones paying more local, uh, you know, local real estate. You know, so it breaks down this 82% of local revenue, and you can see that 70% uh, of that is in real estate taxes of the 82% local, 10% is in earned income tax. So those are kind of our two biggest drivers, you know, here locally, and we'll. Uh, um, you know, talk about and share a little bit of information on that. From the state perspective, you can you, you can not only see that the you know the smaller dollars in the basic ed, special ed, we do not get a lot of you know um, funding from the state, but it kind of shows you the kind of levels of increases that they're you know giving to in those subsidies you know year over year, and the biggest percentage of. Um, you know, state funding is really in the Social Security reimbursement and retirement reimbursements, which I mentioned, you know, that we get 50% back on retirement, okay? So, you know, that's kind of a, you know, if you look at the net comparison of those costs where I showed it was 300000 I, you know, I would kind of take that reimbursement, you know, out all together and just, you know, I always look at, well, what's that net impact to me? Um, so that 50% reimbursement and going back to the market value aid ratios and how those things are adjusted for other, for other schools, you know, we get 50% back for retirement. At my last district that, you know, did not have the, uh, we were not at the bottom of the chart, <laughs> you know, our, our reimbursement for Peacers was 78%, you know. So, there, so those factors, you know, that push it to the local reimbursement to Quaker Valley are throughout, you know, those categories. So if we just talk about real estate assessment, because we're like, you know, that that's our biggest, you know, biggest piece. So we 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 spent a lot of time in this first column, which is just our our budget assessment. So it's the tax rule set by the county, and the timing isn't, you know, isn't always pretty. But you know, so it, it takes into consideration new developments, you know, changes when folks add on to their houses, changes through the appeal process, and they report that data to that. And Miss Trestler tracks all of that for us. And, and lots of details that go, that that go along with it, but um, but it really shows what that growth trend is in the district. But we had, if you look at 15, first of all, the you know the there was reassessment in 12, 13, so 13, 14 was that first year it hit. And when we get to the taxes, you'll see that there was actually a tax decrease, you know, that year. 
and then there were, you know, those next two years, there's all kinds of activity with appeals and whatever. So that's why I have this kind of uh, adjusted for, you know, appeal and real estate exposure, trying to get what our, you know, what our trended growth is in, in that area. Because we're like, oh, well, Quaker Valley, you know, what's the growth? Well, we have all, you know, and how's that impact taxes? Um, so we we see in 15 16 16 17 we didn't show any growth there was nothing hitting the tax rolls you know what we as we dug in it was just a a lot of it was a delay at the county level we started seeing it in 17 17 18 which would be a normal jump for us 8 to 10 million and then as you see in 18 19 Here's where the positive trend comes in that we have $25 million increase in assessed value. So when I look at it over the time, and that's why I like to show this, is because you know really you know some of that some of that did hit in 1718 <laughs> and some of it may have been waiting from 1617 and it, it kind of you know shows a trend over time that averages to about a 10 million dollar increase in assessed in assessed value and at our taxing level that's you know just in growth alone that's 185,000 now in this budget we're showing twice that and almost 400,000 you know increase and I'll talk about how you know some of that actually hit in that 1718 rolls you know a little later so that's that's the basis for the start and then the tax increase that you know we're proposing you know adds to that uh, another 800,000 plus so on the earned income tax side you know we show the show the chart that it's it's been steady rising but the big spike was um, you know back from 2000 you know 8 when the act 32 of 2008 passed you know all districts you know saw revenue increase of about 25 to 35 percent. This is where they eliminated the local tax collectors and consolidated to a taxing commission, required all employers to withhold for everybody local taxes, you know, where they used to only be able, they used to only be required to withhold if you lived in that district or municipality where the business, you know, resided. So now in you know, so there was, you know, obviously a trend that folks may not have been paying their local taxes. So just flipping a, how that hit the, you know, the, the taxes. So you could see the tax rate, 1213, as I just mentioned, was the last countywide reassessment. So you see 1314, the millage rate actually went down. You know, so this has been our historical trend, which typically over this period of time since Act One started, you know, has been roughly two percent has been our average tax increase for operational needs. One indicator and a gauge as to how we compare with our peer districts, because there are you know market factors that you know that take into place to equalize that out. It's a countywide assessment, uh, you know, process that you know that has it you know. Uh, as countywide to sh you know show what that is and as we said all of those factors you know that drive us at the bottom that we have to pay more locally you know get reflected and obviously our rates going to be a little higher even though our market values up here so our rate doesn't have to be as much higher because the market value is higher but it is like I said an indicator of you know for comparison to you know to see where rats not the only comparison in their uh, uh, you know our arguments there and so obviously we're um, 18.4009 is our current and we're projecting next year to be 18.9086 um, I do know that uh, several of our peers are also raising taxes some to the index uh, some some with exceptions and a few that are under the index and I think there's only a couple that are planning you know no increase uh, one that did a um, had the opportunity to do a, a huge bond refinancing and others another one that had some significant re retirement incentive and um, was able to balance that way so what does that mean at that 18.9086 what does that mean to a typical uh, taxpayer here we we use 200,000 which is close to our median assessed value here and that level of taxation would result in another $8.46 um, per month 
So what are, what are we thinking and, and what have we done? Well, obviously, if you look at the you know the big picture, you know we you know we have done some things in addition to uh, the tax increases to, to start moving the you know the ball you know the going in the other direction so to speak, um, and we're really you know focusing on you know both current opportunities and strategic long-term thoughts relative to evaluating staffing staffing needs and making uh, strategic reductions through attrition and program. Shift. So we, you know, have been able to over the last two years had some resignations and retirements and had opportunities to not replace them. Uh, and I've always explained to the you know internal folks here, you don't in school districts you don't always control the timing of when all that stuff occurs. You don't know when. You don't know when somebody's going to resign. You don't know when they're going to retire, and you kind of always have to be looking at that dynamic of what the scheduling, per, you know, where those opportunities may exist to, you know, change scheduling, um, you know, in, in the programs to not impact, you know, programming as much when those changes are made. Uh, so, um, you know, and also um, some other things we do as far as policy changes that could net reductions in spending, and you know, one of those is a recent example, we're changing our uh, policy on graduation requirements for physical education credits and shifting you know, some of that to the, some health programming to the middle school. What, in that big dynamic of what that all means is that it created not only some more opportunities for kids to take additional electives um, you know, and not have that PE requirement when I believe it's 70%, probably more of our kids participate in athletics or activities um, in addition so we, it, it creates additional opportunities for them but also provided us in the scheduling between the middle school and the high school opportunities to um, through attrition you know um, um, reduce a staff member you know so one of the things here is you know what else are we, what else are we going to do besides strategically keep looking at those things um, you know we talk mostly about staffing but it's not like we're not you know within within the budgets I mean we're looking at you know things we just passed on the uh, on the website you know where we were paying twenty thousand dollars a year for you know website you know activity we're going to reduce that it's you know to five thousand dollars with a new provider you know th those types of things are being looked at you know throughout the budget and shifting resources as well um, you know but other things that we've we've done all along that have helped the district is you know grant funding for professional development and student programs you know that we've done and this this caught this next one which is what I want to hit on was cost saving robust partnerships with learning communities higher ed foundations and corporations is you know we have relationships with and Dr. Onda can chime in with you know Carnegie Mellon and so some of these collaborative things that we may not have got to that level of this professional teaching that course or whatever but we are certainly looking at those learning environment opportunities to do it and you know whether it you know depending on how that impacts the you know scheduling or what class comes out of that or how that education looks it could be a dynamic that we're shift back to you know the legislative action we talked about some you know some things for you know property tax relief that's happening and school choice um, you know programs that are out or, or legislation that that's potentially out there and um, you know our legislators have a big say in you know how these dollars get allocated and 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 shifted so to speak and you know some some other things that we've been you know working with them on as far as advocating for you know is obviously you know piecers and you know trying to you know solve that you know solve that problem with either additional funding or or uh, different um, you know mecha mechanisms to um, benefits provided under the program in various mandate reliefs and talking about cyber charter tuition on the other side not to enhance school choice necessarily but at least to at least to create a, a fair funding formula you know for those um, you know for those schools um, and then the mandated testing that we talked about and you know some of those things that could be you know put some relief back and you know um, you know in that transportation piece I've you know flew through the transportation piece but you know I mean it, even if we got rid of um, you know if we got rid of transportation just say we just cut the lot cut the whole 
commitment caboodle, well, we're not doing it, you know, because we can't afford to do it. We would still have to provide busing to the charter schools and non-publics, because that's what the code says. So those are just examples of, not that we would do that, it's just an example of, you know, some of that legislative, you know, things that are in there. So, um, and like I said, we will have it posted, but, you know, we, we uh, want to make sure that, you know, not only we're serving as advocates for our taxpayers, but, uh, and I know our board has, and, and participating in lots of activities, but certainly the taxpayers have a voice and, uh, you know, and can, as they see, you know, these uh, things come to pass, can, you know, certainly call us to get more information and input, you know, but, you know, definitely the folks that represent you and represent public education are, are listed here. Great schools equal great communities. Communities that invest in youth prosper. Some of our our things, you know, we, you know, our 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 budget, uh, um, you know, challenges that that we are facing, that all public schools are facing. You know, we're really taking you know strong strategic looks at reducing without, while protecting and preserving those programs, and while maintaining, you know, the uh, and and focusing on delivering to the mission you know, the vision and mission and beliefs of the district that they collaboratively set um, and invest in, in our youth and continue to do that.